Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a fun take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me as ever is the Professor. Alan, what is the soundtrack for your current mood? Narcissistic Cannibal by Khan. Nice. Okay. That sets a toe. <laughs> Feeling ferocious today, Tom. Oh, I like that. Okay, ferocious. Despite it being yeah. the end of your long day. I feel like a Tyrannosaurus, not a Stegosaurus. Good. Speaking of which, I met someone recently who had the same body mass to brain ratio as a Stegosaurus. Did you? Yeah. I won't say who, but it was mathematically proven. Sorry, we're off topic again. <laughs> it's uh, mysterious. Man. Right. Kookaburra news. How's your kookaburra? <laughs> oh, no, it's magpie this week. Oh, and they are nasty out there, aren't they? Dive bomb you. Yeah, there's, there, uh, there was a study done where they were tracking them, putting little radio trackers on the back of the magpie. And what the magpies do is they go on to their mates and ask their friend to take the tracker off for them. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> the, the mate just undoes it and then throws it to one side. And like, I, I suspect that given probably within the next five years, magpies will run the world. They'll be the new world order. Covid's are so smart. I like that we've got like Australian yeah. bird news to, to kick off the Deep Sea podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of fascinating. Yeah. It is weird because honestly, they're, they're, sometimes I'm swear they're talking to you. I mean, it, it is a thing on Twitter, like Team Fish and Team Bird. There is a, a war going on online between the marine biologists and the uh, ornithologists. Don't get me wrong, I don't like birds. I'm just telling you that they're, they're coming for you. <laughs> they're going to get us all. <laughs> nice. On the topic of deep sea, deep sea news for this month. I've been struggling to, to keep up, unfortunately. Uh, I don't have a great deal. I did have a couple of studies, and as ever, I'll put it in the show notes so you can do some wider reading. Nice paper out, and then covered in a few of the media outlets on um, using environmental DNA at abyssal depths. It's all the overlooked things, basically, that make up most of that that biosphere. So it's sort of smaller stuff that you, you would say miss from a visual survey. Fairly unsurprisingly, most were found to be unknown to science, so uh, undescribed. And it said that the ocean's abyss is home to at least three times the diversity of life as the waters above. Really nice study. Don't you also capture everything which is above as it rains down? They filtered that out. Ah, okay, right. They compared it to the, the sequencing of the surface waters and then sort of removed that from the signal because of course the assumption is that that everything is raining down did you have any news you accidentally stumbled upon your own news i saw something that said scientists set to explore the deepest parts of the indian ocean or something like that. i thought oh that's interesting I wonder who that is and i opened it up and it was me so, <laughs> so, oh well oh that sounds right <laughs> up my alley oh oh it's me yeah that, that sounds exactly <laughs> what we do who is this imposter oh it's me yeah, so that was that. So we had the launch of the new Deep Sea Centre this month. So it was on the back of that. My news really is we're building new landers. And I went to a machine shop this morning and saw them for the first time. Got three new full ocean depth landers being constructed. Quite exciting. Birth of a new generation. Taking them to sea a week on Tuesday. I mean, yeah, nothing like sort of throwing them in while they're still hot from welding. Yeah, no, it's a genuine thing. So I'm taking them on a boat a week on Tuesday going about 200 miles south to the Diamantina Fracture Zone. It's a big, huge, massive manganese nodule field, which is a bit annoying, but it is what it is. Is that public knowledge yet? Yeah, that one is, yeah. It's even got a name. It's called the Cape Blue, I think, or something like that. So how far it stretches either side is a bit of an unknown, but it's certainly clustered around the south side of the Diamantina Fracture Zone, which runs for hundreds and hundreds of miles anyway. But yeah, so we're going to put it all together, put it on this boat I've never worked on before. And the first time these things are going to get wet is when we release them to 6,500 metres. What could go wrong? I'm quite nervous about that. I think I'm getting too old for this thing. <laughs> this is a young man's game. You know, back in the days of firing this stuff off, we're completely untested, untried. Can't even remember if you put the lens cap off. Let's kick it over the back. But yeah. Are you still considering names? I do need names. I've got three landers and they desperately need names that make sense or non-offensive or not from any particular culture, quite different from one another. Is it you have the tradition that they don't get a name until they're successful? It was, it was. So Hadelander A eventually became Alfie and Hadelander B eventually became Nacho. But then both of them died, so Hadelander C never got a name. And it's miraculously still mostly kicking around. So maybe I shouldn't give them names. Maybe I should just call them D, E and F. Well, because we're getting superstitious. Yeah. We try not to get superstitious, but there's something about bad days at sea which kind of make you superstitious. You once blamed it on your beard. You once had a shave because, because you'd had a bad day. <laughs> I did. That was off, uh, it was in New, off Caledonia. New Caledonia. Yeah. Yeah. We had a very bad day and it made you shave because you'd never grown a beard before. <laughs> it was one of those ones. I know this is a long shot, but it might, it, it might be my beard. <laughs> He's the gods. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it was either like throw Ryan over the side. We might have done both just to be sure. We're talking about a, an old undergraduate student of ours called Ryan, and I wonder if he's listening. We excommunicated him because he refused to move from Aberdeen to Newcastle with us, so we decided never to speak to him again. And we send him one text message a year with a picture of Tom's tattoo on it. It's less than a, a year. It's like years go by. That's twice in six years. Then. We ping him. <laughs> I'm pinging him just to check he's still alive. We've mentioned on the podcast that you hold a grudge, and this is the level of grudge you're willing to hold. Yeah, we haven't actually spoken to him now in, what, six years? No, you'll text him, but then you won't speak to him. Don't, I don't write on the text message. I just send him a picture of your arm, just so he knows that it's from me and it's a picture of you, so he knows we're still working together. No, we're still watching him. If you if you are listening around, say hi, and I, I will talk to you, even though Alan will refuse to. No, I will. I've just got another 10 years to get out of my system. I feel betrayed because he wouldn't come with us. So He wouldn't pack his life up. If you're not with us, you're against us. That's the spirit. Yeah, that's academia for you. <laughs> we've got a few listener questions we could touch upon. And one of them, if we've got to unpack you psychologically, could be an interesting one. I've just made a note of this question and I forgot who actually wrote it in. I had a quick look through the emails and I couldn't find who it was. So I'm really sorry if you're hearing this question and you know it's from you, but I just I couldn't find out where I'd... I'd made a note of it. It matters, but I, I, I didn't make a note of your name. I'm sorry. Somebody asked... How did we meet and start working together? Which is quite an interesting story. Congo, West Africa. Should we tell it from opposite ends? Right. So from what I remember, I think it was Charles de Gaulle Airport. We were all sat in the bar drinking away on the way to the Congo. And there was a guy that was with us. He was quite a sensitive lad. And he was moaning that he was having to pay someone to look after his cats for a month while he was away. And I was explaining to him that it might be cheaper to just dispose of the cats and buy new ones at the end right? as, a, <laughs> as a joke and it looked absolutely horrified and then we went to the Congo from, from my side of it I was working with a marine survey company doing environmental surveys usually before sort of oil and gas development so you check what the habitat was beforehand you would uphold the environmental legislation and basically monitor that it wasn't too badly damaged with the bit of work that had to be done so that was my old hat at the time but I wanted to get back into sort of research like I wanted to go out into the real world a little bit I thought that would grow me up really well and it was a really tough life so it did but I wanted to come back into academia Alan came on board with it was the Robio Lander at the time yep. as one of the survey devices we got on really well anyway it was great fun working together and i really fell for the lander system because even though i'd had an interest in the deep sea it, it had always been classically those those trawled up specimens and not seeing the animals in their right light and then suddenly there was this device that was really low impact it was really easy to, to deploy and recover and then you got to see the animals in life in these really beautiful pictures and it was sort of showing me the deep sea in a way i'd never seen it before and so i just loved that as a method uh, especially because you didn't have to kill anything and you got all this great data. So yeah, we just sort of got on really well. And that was the opportunity to get back into academia and started working with deep sea corals then was the first step into getting deeper and deeper. Also a much nicer version of the story than disposing of cats. And... Than cats as like a single use camera. Yeah. Use it once and then you can buy a new one. <laughs> I remember in that job one day that all the power just went off and the whole ship just started drifting sideways. And it was like 40 degrees outside. And it's just like the zero power. We're all sort of sat on the deck going, uh, what are we going to do? Someone said, don't worry, the chief engineer is on this. At that point, the chief engineer just came running out on deck wearing ear defenders, was holding a sledgehammer, and then went down the stairs to the engine room. And about two minutes later, you just hear the generators come up again. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so whatever, whatever <laughs> was wrong with, with the ship, it was fixed yeah. with a sledgehammer. <laughs> it's like, all right. It was the closest I've ever been to being hit by lightning. If I remember right, we had to drop somebody off. I think it was in Soyo, Angola or something like that. We came into some little harbour somewhere in Angola and it was just this enormous like tropical rainstorm and then it was like lightning like hit the ship or something, I don't know, but it, oof, that was something else. It bounced off the ship. We were like leaning over the rail just watching the coastline and chatting. I think it hit the water, but it was, I'm serious, it was like six metres away and it, it's one of those things mm. where I'm, I've convinced myself it's a false memory, but I'm glad you remember it as well. But yeah, it, it was... No, I remember it. It I felt was like right the whole there. chest cavity nearly exploded. Yeah. <laughs> And you could smell it. You could smell the ozone. And there was like a crackle in yeah. the air. It was really weird. It was a fun job, that one. I think on that data you're talking about, I still think those photos off West Africa are some of the best types of photos I've ever taken. I mean, they're scientifically, they're fine as well. But I mean, they're just, a, they're just beautifully framed. It's like they were all, all the fish were behaving and just sort of <laughs> nicely framing themselves and that. They were great. It's a lovely camera, that. It was. We were shooting it in sort of dingle-dangle looking down from above mode and then also in the in the profile mode which gets the really attractive pictures mm. where you, you sort of look at the animals from side on but yeah i, I just yeah. remember being like blown away by this piece of kit because it was just 
you get, you get to see it, you get to experience these animals. And that, that's not how I'd seen them. And we were using a drop camera. So it's not like I hadn't put a camera down into the deep sea before, but just, I don't know, you get so much more of the fish's personality when they're sort of posing in front of the camera rather than just sort of yeah. skimming along. Oh, we never said when that was. That was, if I remember right, April 2008. Your memory's so much better than mine. Was it really that long ago? Yeah. My life's just accelerating. Time is passing much, much quicker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You'll be dead before you know it. So, I mean, one day the magpie will come and take you. Well, someone told me this morning about the number of children who lose eyeballs. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I know. It's just like, really, is there anything in this country that doesn't want you dead? Even the animals we have at home, it's like they've got the eye-eating version. <laughs> I know. This, I've got a bush in my back garden, which apparently is only poisonous to children. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and they call it the Hansel and Gretel bush, and it looks like it's made of sweets. <laughs> yeah, it's just insane, isn't it? It's just like every story. It's like, oh no, be careful because that'll kill you. All right, it's lovely here. Anyway, so what was the other question? So the other one I do remember that was from Shelley, and it's more of a thought piece. I don't actually know the answer to this, but the stereotype that say goldfish only have a three-second memory is that true of? deep sea fish but that sort of idea that fish are very stupid and have no memory that got me thinking because a lot of the deep sea fish the brain is a really energetically expensive organ and so they've actually stripped it down as much as possible and so what do deep sea fish have to remember do they have any memory why do goldfish get a bad deal in this i guess just people's like exposure to them are any fish clever oh definitely some are really smart so things like puffer fish or members of the cichlid family they will look you in the eye when they're looking at you but you're right i remember drinking in prince albert the second of monaco's museum i can be entirely out of my depth and just drinking champagne leaning against the tank over the puffer fish and it's just i was just sitting there having a nice little chat with the prince albert's puffer they're really smart it, it seemed very intelligent i must admit we had some freshwater rays at the aquarium i used to work at and they learned the uniform so members of the public go past and they ignore them but somebody wearing the aquarium uniform, they'd start begging and sort of trying to get fed. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, I don't think we're ever going to figure out the whole deep sea thing, because the problem with deep sea is you can't study them alive. Well, yeah, not right now at least. So how do you do an experiment to, to figure out if it's memorised something or not? Even sort of whether it would need to. I couldn't think of something that they would need to remember. They just need to respond to stimulus and there'll be evolutionary selection for sort of certain, certain instincts. Yeah. But I can't think of anything where they would need to learn to cope with something. Because we, as we've discussed on this, the some of them can't even cope with a complex structure with a three-dimensional shape yeah. because they're so used to being out in open water. Wow. That, so what you're saying is deep sea fish are so boring they don't need to remember anything. It might drive you insane if you're going to live for 60 years and never really see anything. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Because, yeah, if, if you remember such a long and boring life, it will make you crazy. Maybe in having a very short-term memory is that. It saves our life. Yeah, the more I thought about it, the more I found that really interesting because the, the brain is such an expensive organ and the deep sea fish, at least the, the ones sort of on a tight energy budget, have reduced it as much as they can. Anyway, so going back to the Congo for a second, those were, I think, a remarkable set of images. And unfortunately, most of them have never really seen the light of day. I think some of the sharky ones, the Portuguese dogfish ones, have been in various magazines and stuff like that because they're quite good. But most of them don't see the light of day and, and that's in part because... I personally have never been very good at submitting these things to online repositories. And that's a thing that's becoming more and more popular these days. I think we are going to go down that route in one way or another. It's incredibly valuable, I think, because certainly in the business we're in, is the taxonomic drawing of an animal gives you a certain amount of information. But most of the time, you don't have the privilege of having the animal in a controlled environment where you're actually making measurements that you can compare to a taxonomic description, right? You, you've basically got a video of something or, a, or an image of something, and it's really, really, really useful to compare that to as many images as you can that other people have taken. I came up recently, actually. We had a paper submitted, and we had a picture of the animal in the paper, and one of the reviewers said, you've got to take that picture out, because unless it's a taxonomic drawing, it's just a pretty picture, and it doesn't mean anything. And they actually made us take it out in the end. Really? I, I really disagree with that. If I read a paper on an animal, I'd like to see a picture of it. And it also means that, you know, this is species A. This is what it looked like at this particular point in time. And this is what we refer to it as. And over time, as let's say there's 100 papers published on that. There is that sort of visual record of what that thing looked like, which I think is incredibly valuable. And not just saying, well, we don't have to show a picture of it because you've named it. Well, there's two elements. There's like, just trust us. No one can then check your ID. Yeah, because there has been cases where we've got it wrong and someone else has got it wrong. And you look back on something 10 years later and you go, hang on, that species number three or whatever it is, that's probably not that now. Because we've, we've gathered up more and more images. And once you get those big libraries going, it's easier to, to contextualise 
what you're working on at that point, right? And what's weird as well, this is, I'm going on a bit of a rant now. So this particular journal, this reviewer said, no, no, no pretty pictures. It has to be a data picture, if you like. And we had another paper in actually the same journal. And we mentioned in there that on this particular submersible transect, we had seen some litter. And we just wrote in a sentence, like, like there was a couple of plastic bags and whatever. And both reviewers said, you need to show that litter. And we're like, well, no, because surely the whole point of a figure or an image is to give some information that perhaps the text doesn't. So if I said, we saw a plastic bag at the bottom of the sea, is anyone going to be confused as to what we were getting at with that statement? And then you show them a picture of a plastic bag at the bottom of the sea and you go, ah, a plastic bag at the bottom of the sea. And it's not like you're going to compare that plastic bag to other plastic bags or take measurements of this plastic bag. You know, I thought that was really weird. Within the same week in the same journal, someone's saying, take a picture of the animal you're talking about because it's useless. But please, 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 please put in a picture of a plastic bag at the bottom of the sea. So I, I dug my heels in and refused to. One of them even said, because it's a really good bandwagon right now. Really? As clear as that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, the point is that these big image archives repositories are actually becoming really, really useful. It's great for joining us up. So you need to find Tom. You need to find <laughs> someone. You need to get you find someone who knows all about this. Well, one of these collaborative repositories that is emerging very recently, and one I've been keeping an eye on, is FathomNet. So it's coming out of Mbari and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. It's an open source image database and you can search by species or even sort of substrate and different types of litter and things like that. There's a few extra interesting categories in there when I was having a mooch through there and by location and you can find labeled and geolocated images of the critters you're interested in. And this is useful in itself. Say a researcher wants to see where this species has been seen before, if they want to validate their identification, if they want to see you know this from different angles. And, and as Alan was touching upon with the, the taxonomic illustrations, a, a lot of these deep sea critters, they look so different in life and in situ than they do when they're trawled up, which is often how the taxonomic illustrations come about. So you get the dichotomous keys, which is basically lots of little choice choice gates, basically. So does it have this? No. It's like a, a choose your own adventure novel, but at the end of it, you get a species. But the problem is you need an unbroken chain, basically, to use those which almost always relies on having the animal in your hands. And then both that and the taxonomic illustration are based on something that's been trawled up and likely looks very different. So these databases, as we get more visual, as we tend to take pictures of things rather than trawl them up, are getting more and more important. I had um, a PhD student emailing me today for some help because she's looking for in situ images of a particular species that people have talked about, but very few images have been put up. Uh, it's things like this that have got to really help her out. What species was it? It was Corophonoides profundiculus. Comes up a lot in the trawls. I can help you out there. Have you got those? Yeah, I've got some from Porcupine there. Yeah. They're really small little uh, rat tails. They look a bit like the tiny Mediterranean ones. Yes. Yeah, I've got some of those, yeah. Oh, can you send me those on? Huh? Are we still recording this on the show? Well, a, a bit of science just happened, so that that's quite nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she'd be really grateful because she did ask if you had any. So, yeah, and, and wider patterns might emerge as we start putting all this data together. So maybe we're going to spot, oh, hey, this color morph tends to be in this area, but the darker ones tend to be down south and things like that. L little interesting things that emerge after you get lots and lots of data. So this is already enough. This is already, like, super useful to the community, but anyone tech savvy is going to notice that loads and loads of painstakingly labeled images of something from all sorts of different angles in all sorts of different conditions is exactly what you need to train a machine learning algorithm. And then things get exciting. Doing things we've never done before, basically, like a bit of a technology renaissance. So really exciting field that I am very excited to talk to someone about. And I have managed to secure <laughs> FathomNet co-founder Kakani Katija. She is a bioengineer at the Bioinspired Lab at Embari, also a visiting professor of aerospace. She's a natural geographic explorer and a former USA ice dancer, I noticed in her portfolio as well. And she was really, really good to come on the show. Due to scheduling issues, we were a little bit tight getting this interview in. And it's the Ocean Sciences meeting this week. She is absolutely swamped, but she was good enough to come on and have a quick chat to us. So uh, like a really impressive person and a very willing person to sort of give up her time to to have a chat with us today because uh, she did not have time for this. So we're, we're very grateful that she did take the time. Hello. 
Kakani, thank you so much for coming on to have a chat with us. I know uh, you're horribly, horribly busy right now. <laughs> you're uh, <laughs> attending the Ocean Science Meeting and there's a million other things going on as well. Yeah, it, I'd say uh, what's exceptional this week is the Ocean Sciences Meeting. Um, but thank you, Tom, for, for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. We're so grateful you uh, you spared a bit of energy for us. So just to begin with, can you introduce us to, to FathomNet? Right. Uh, so FathomNet is a database, essentially, that that contains labeled data. Uh, And when I mean labeled data, I I mean imagery and associated metadata that people can use to know what they're looking at in an underwater image. What we're trying to do is contain or collect information on all of the life that lives within the ocean to provide a resource so that people can either learn, understand, or even strive to find new life that we've perhaps already observed, you know, using a number of different imaging platforms or expeditions. And so really the goal of FathomNet is to is to connect the ocean community and share that visual data that they already have so that we can enrich it and get valuable information out of it. Even at its very superficial sort of primary level, it is an incredibly useful resource and it gets our sporadic scattered data together. Looking through some of the data, like multiple, multiple platforms. I'm, I'm seeing baited landers, I'm seeing autonomous vehicles and, and even some sub stuff as well. There's, there's a massive variety of data in here. And to your point, I mean, that's what we really hope Fathom that will become to the community. I mean, we did a beta launch of the database uh, uh, either late September or October. And so we're airing all of our dirty laundry, right? Because we want people to see <laughs> <laughs> the the potential here. Right now, the data that's in FathomNet has been seeded by existing data sets that we were able to access. So for example, Mbari's video annotation reference system, the NOAA's Okeanos Explorer, the ROV Deep Discoverer database, as well as the National Geographic Society's like drop camera systems. And these are also partners in the FathomNet project. And using that label data that already exists in these databases, we were able to ingest them into FathomNet. And really, it's it's kind of this initial demonstration of, of what we can do with something like FathomNet, which can host distributed labeled data. So if you are a researcher in the UK, or if you're a researcher in Japan or South Africa, and you have labeled data, FathomNet can aggregate that information and then make it available to anyone who wants to use it. At least in the last decade, maybe the last 20 years, we've had a real deep sea renaissance almost, uh, certainly in the the extreme depths we're going back again and mm-hmm. it feels like there's been a big shift in the form of our data and now it's almost exclusively visual most of our data is visual currently mm-hmm. so what's the current bottleneck in understanding the deep ocean now that we're getting all this visual data the biggest bottleneck and you know the marine imaging community will totally unanimously agree with me on this is is actually processing that information right turning pixels into actual data points like animal names concepts abundances densities, right? And then making that available to researchers or management institutions, etc. So it's processing that information, converting visual data to something that can be useful for researchers is the massive bottleneck that the community is facing. And I think that might be surprising to the sort of average listener who maybe doesn't work in marine science is that footage of the deep sea, we talk about how rare that is and, and what an opportunity that is. But actually our bottleneck is processing it. There's more mm-hmm. video and images than there are skilled people who can turn that into data and turn that into something usable. The tragedy of that is that within a certain project's funding or within just the interest of the research group that's working with it, mm-hmm. there's actually a lot of data that's lost, that's wasted because nobody has the time to, to really process it. Well, absolutely. And then, I mean, there's the time, but then there's also the expertise. Like you mentioned, a lot of labs or a lot of groups hire volunteers or interns or graduate students to process visual data. But for a particular question, like something about maybe fish distributions or coral distributions, the focus then is then on those groups. But the challenge, right, is visual data is so rich with information. You know, you've got entire communities that you could be characterizing with that same data set. And so, you know, one, having that expertise to be able to identify everything in visual data is extremely hard. Never mind that we really haven't supported taxonomy communities, right? I mean, that's unfortunately a community that is really impacted and has changed a lot. And it's that input that we desperately need and need to figure out a way, right, to leverage that expertise and share it more broadly. I want to make sure to make the 
point that I don't see this ever replacing taxonomy or the need for taxonomists. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think it's a mechanism that we can use to potentially enrich that community and bolster that community because without their input, something like this will never be successful. Yeah. Their skill set is absolutely crucial to the work we do. We, we cannot interpret these animals that we're looking at without their decoding of, of what we're really seeing. Mm -hmm. Part of the worry would be that this would almost be a digital replacement for them, but I really don't feel that's the case. You know, if, they, if that was the case, then they, they should also never write a book or never publish a paper because that's them imparting that knowledge on others. Mm -hmm. They're very much a part of this solution, aren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you do make an interesting point that there's a number of different ways to share knowledge. But, but to be frank, like for Fathom it to be successful, we absolutely rely on taxonomists or parataxonomists to, to be providing accurate information or contributing to FathomNet directly. You know, for example, there's a huge community of individuals that watch ROV dives that are on the internet or live streamed. And this community of people, I mean, they're just so amazing and phenomenal. And they, over time, have really enlisted the help and the input of professional taxonomists. Like, what is this squid? Let's tweet out to this person. Let's get this information. Yeah. And we'll get an ID on YouTube, right? Yeah. Like in somewhere hidden in a YouTube chat. And now I'm not saying that that isn't fantastic, but then what happens to that YouTube comment. It doesn't go into a database anywhere. It, it contributes to knowledge, but it isn't packaged in a way that it can be shared more broadly or accessed more broadly. And so that's something that we're really trying to address with FathomNet and the future of FathomNet, right, is to create a repository where all of that knowledge can be searched and accessed and, and shared and also built upon, right? Because how many times have we probably visualized or observed an animal that we haven't described yet. You know, there's all of these, <laughs> I could go on forever and ever about this, but, <laughs> but, I, but I really think the only way for this to be successful is if we have a, a strong community around FathomNet. And that includes taxonomists and computer scientists and enthusiasts and obviously the marine science community. What I'm hoping is that FathomNet will be able to provide that community glue to bring all of these expertise and knowledge and frankly excitement about the ocean in one place. And I think it may even encourage the next generation. When we're trying to becoming a taxonomic expert, suddenly there's this new version of it where information is coming from all over the world, from sort of autonomous vehicles or things mm -hmm. like that. And, and you are the expert and pitching that to the next generation is something very exciting. I think there'll be this modern interpretation, tempt people into the field, which is a really meticulous and intimidating field for a lot of people. Yeah, it's really important for us to figure out mechanisms for us to leverage expertise when it truly is needed. There's a lot of animals that researchers have seen a number of times. There are instances where animals haven't been seen very many times. And so how do you create a discovery pipeline that is efficient and knows when to reach out to the relevant expertise when it's actually needed? And that's all built into this. But what I hope is Fathom then is the first step for us to, you know, essentially be able to build that community. What the data within FathomNet will hopefully enable is the training of algorithms like machine learning or deep learning algorithms that will allow us to automate the processing of underwater visual data. Based on what I know and what I've seen with algorithms, the even cutting edge algorithms that are emerging from the CVPRs or the NeurIPS of the world, I don't see artificial intelligence completely replacing people with expertise. But what I do see is an opportunity for us to take some really interesting advancements in technology and potentially creating a bridge between the taxonomic communities and AI and really enrich and grow the taxonomic community, right? Providing opportunities for training or opportunities for input and collaboration and attribution that did not exist before. In moving towards, you know, leveraging the power of, of machine learning, Mm -hmm. we are no longer limited by our human senses. But at the moment, we're sort of using trichromatic cameras because they mirror our eyes. And so we can look at the images and understand those. But once we embrace this as a method, we can put some, you know, hyperspectral cameras, LIDAR, we can add extra channels of data that a, an algorithm can interpret just as easily as, as we look at an image. That's the hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get there eventually, but really it's this processing bottleneck 
that is mm-hmm. a massive problem. And in order to get to that point of being able to automate that whole process, you need labeled data. And if we're trying to holistically observe, you know, the ocean or biological communities, that requires combining expertise across all these different taxonomic hierarchies uh, to be able to do that. That's the goal of, of Fathomit. Every marine scientist listening has folders and folders of data that there just hasn't been the time or the resources to process. So that almost mm-hmm. as this matures, there's so much we could throw at it because I'm, I'm a fish guy and I know there's invertebrates hanging around there. I know there's really interesting habitats and sediment, sediments in the background as well that I'm just, I'm not trained and I'm not able to, to properly interpret. So that there's probably staggering data and firsts in even my old data. This will almost be a, a single explosion point that radiates future and past because it's going to unlock right. a lot of our old data as well. I shouldn't be surprised by, but I've been blown away by is the fact we've already collected so much data about the ocean. And, you know, I'm reminded with maybe it was the first or second episode on the podcast, you know, the idea that we're always comparing ocean exploration versus space exploration. And mm-hmm. actually my background's in aerospace engineering. So I, I could talk about this for ages, but the idea is that we have observed a lot of the ocean. We just don't have a mechanism to share that information really easily. And I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but this is especially true for visual data or biological information. If we think about the communities that have done amazing, fantastic work in distributed sensing, you know, global scale observations, you've got, you know, obviously satellites and remote sensing, but you also have floats like Argo floats or biogeochemical array, right? So you've got chemical and physical sensing that it does phenomenal work. But aside from being able to observe phytoplankton at the near surface, we really haven't scratched the surface very much of scaling biological observations. But we have a ton of data already from individual groups, individual institutions, that if we could put it together, I mean, we'd be an amazing starting point and also a stepping off point for the future. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i talking about Fathomnet here and, and we're also in the process of building the next phase. And this is something I've talked to researchers from all over the world about is now that we have this labeled data, then how do we create an infrastructure, but also community around processing this data? And that effort's called Ocean Vision AI. The idea being that can we do something like this where we can combine expertise outside of the ocean sciences, like human computer interactions or human AI interactions researchers or video game developers, obviously computer scientists or computer vision experts, but bring all of this expertise together to help address this visual data processing bottleneck. But again, for any of that to be successful, we, we need something like Fathomnet. And so the only way for Fathomnet to be successful is, is if we're able to build a community around it. That's kind of where we're at now. We're trying to get people to take a look give us input, tell us what they want to see or any ideas for improvement. And then we can go from there. We're trying to promote people contributing back to the community in some way. If you are a marine researcher, obviously you're you're contributing data with the hope that you'll be able to have these algorithms that then apply to your data. But if you're a computer scientist, we weren't sure how do we create a mechanism for them to contribute back. And so what we've starting to build is what we're calling a FathomNet model zoo. It's on our GitHub <laughs> And um, what it is, is it's a place where people who use the Fathomnet data and train algorithms, that they can then share them back to the community. And the reason why we want to do this, right, is because computational time isn't the cheapest thing. But we can also start from someone else's algorithms, apply them to our data, correct where there might be inaccuracies, create more labeled data, and then retrain models. And so that iterative process can be sped up so much more if you have models to already start from. This is part of the reason why we have, I think, three models now in the model zoo. It's derived primarily from and Bari data. But the point being is that anyone can then use those algorithms for their use cases. These models learn and improve as we go. It becomes a feedback loop. Mm-hmm. Certain things it won't be able to identify. So then you can pass that back to your taxonomic expert who will then be able to label that data and feed it back into the model. And the model's learning at the same time and improving. Yeah, it's just this brilliant sort of self-sustaining system once once we get going. The other thing that we've been learning a lot from the computer science community, because at the point we've been trying to talk to as many experts as we possibly could. I mean, the way we built FathomNet is it's devoid of any 
use case or any information for someone outside of the marine science community to know, okay, what are the major challenges? What are the major questions that this data are trying to solve or address? And what that means is one of the things that the FathomNet team is starting to work on is benchmarking particular use cases. So if you want an object detector that will indicate all the different animals that might be in the image, the classification doesn't have to be accurate, but, you know, a bounding box can be drawn around it. You know, that that's one particular use case. If you want to study or identify vulnerable marine ecosystems or VMEs, that's a very important use case across a lot of different users we've spoken with. So developing models, either binary, this is a VME or not, or individual groups within or classes within what a definition of VME is trying to come up with benchmarks for that kind of model is important. And then we have another group member, Eric Ornstein, who's trying to partition the FathomNet data into what we call distribution shifts. You know, the idea that if you train a model in one place, let's say, and you apply it on data that's been collected in another place, the model's aren't robust. And this is a problem if it's, you know, data collected in different places, different lighting conditions, different days, different instrumentation. And this is a problem that's known in the terrestrial space as well, and it's not solved. And so by presenting the data or presenting FathomNet as a rich collection of distribution shifts, the goal then would be for us to be able to entice computer scientists and computer vision experts to work on those problems. Where we really want to be able to get to, you know, be able to ID everything in an image that we know, but also call out situations where we come up on something that we don't know or is unknown. And we can do that hopefully soon, but we won't be able to get there if we don't have this information or these data pipelines in place. The other thing we're thinking a lot about with FathomNet is there's kind of this expectation that if you're a taxonomist, you're just going to do this for free. And I don't think that's fair. What we're really trying to figure out within FathomNet is like, how do we create a system of attribution? If you're providing either data or expertise or a label or correction, that that information is saved in the database, but also potentially included in like a publication if we treat databases or data sets equivalent to publications. With the taxonomy issue, because it is it is also a group of specialists who are really taking advantage of and almost, you know, through their own passion, help a lot of people out for free, often omitted from grants. And then mm. if there's a couple of emails just almost asking for a favor, it's like, oh, I don't know what this is. There needs to be a way of sort of structuring that. There almost needs to be a, a tip jar. You don't always know what you're going to find going in. It is hard to write the grant ahead of time, you know, knowing what you're going to find and what taxonomic skills you're going to need. Maybe we need to go almost full digital gig economy. Tick to your taxonomist for the for answering the question on the email, which at the moment we're, we're pretty bad for just saying thank you and mentioning in the acknowledgements. We can learn a lot from existing platforms like the iNaturalists of the world or eBird, which comes out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the ways that they've engaged professional taxonomists, but also a much broader community. Because there's a lot of people out there that have expertise, like for instance, this live stream oceanographic group that they have watched more ROV footage <laughs> than pretty much any marine researcher out there. And I know those are fighting words, but the point is, is like this group has also accumulated so much knowledge. So like, how do we bring them into the fold? So like, how do we bring people who are enthusiasts into the fold and contribute meaningfully to science? And like, say you have an autonomous vehicle in a place that we haven't visited very often. As this data is coming in, you can have a group of individuals live stream annotating this footage. So what if one of these people noticed something odd or peculiar or, oh, this is an interesting animal. Let me tag it. And the flags are then notifies a lot of other researchers to have them go take a look. And if all the researchers agree, oh, this is odd, this might be something undescribed, then you can bump that observation to the next phase of the process. But because you were the individual that first observed it, we can track that information and you can be added to, let's say, the paper or these talks as a contributor to this whole entire process. I'm sure if this has come across your mind, but like almost gamifying the process. Oh, absolutely. The amount of time and energy people say put into Wikipedia because mm -hmm. it's credited and because they're there as an editor and you can see the bits that they contributed. People are amassing this huge repository of human knowledge just for that because it's, it's visible, it's seen. And 
glad you brought up gamifying because that's something we've been thinking a lot about. And in fact, we're working with Gautam Shah, CEO and head of Internet of Elephants, which is a group based out of Kenya that's developed games or gaming experiences around camera trap data. And I think what blew my mind just before the pandemic or during the pandemic was seeing people wandering the streets in my neighborhood looking for Pokemon. Yes. Right? <laughs> Playing... <laughs> Playing Pokemon Go. This was a global international phenomenon. People are literally wandering the streets of their neighborhood looking for fake animals. And they know the habitat types. They know where they're likely to be. They know what times of day they'll be out. <laughs> it's incredible. And this is the thing. It's like, what if some of that energy could be used for literally exploring life that exists on our planet, in our ocean, that we know nothing about. And I think we can do that. I think we can do that. What would be like a, a brilliant get to sort of launch the gamifying of this? I've also had really great conversations with Alan Gershenfeld, who's the developer for or the mastermind behind Beyond Blue. And one of the things we've been talking about is the marvelization of ocean science. Can we create engagement around scientists or the characters that are involved in this process. And when you think about superheroes, you think about the ocean, I, th I think about Aquaman. <laughs> 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 and would it be amazing if we were able to have Aquaman, aka Jason Momoa, like be involved in this video game concept, creating opportunities for anyone to participate in ocean exploration and discovery? Anyone listening is a, like a distant cousin. <laughs> Um, <laughs> can we link these folks up? Because uh, that is something I would absolutely love to see. I would appreciate it. You never know. It's, it's always worth throwing out there into the universe. Thank you so much for your time. I have already run you late into your meeting, which you're absolutely meant to be at. So from all of us here, thank you so much for your time. I think we've got so much more to talk about. There are at least two other enormous topics that I think are worthy of their own interviews. So I would love to get you back again in the future when uh, we're not so frantic on time. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Please check out FathomNet. It will only be successful if, if the community participates and, and contributes. So thank you. Fantastic. There'll be loads of links down in the show notes for you to learn more about FathomNet and some of the wider topics we've discussed. Hello, this is oceanographer and explorer Don Walsh with another little sea story for you. I call this one Love at Sea, Life on Board the Cruise Ships. But first, a spoiler alert. This one's more humorous than educational. However, I wanted to do a follow-on to my recent broadcast on Love at the Sea. Now, in a former life, I was fortunate to get invited to be a shipboard lecturer. This is 1973. My reward was a offer of a cruise, which I took uh, after I had consulted for them about how to set up the first shipboard cultural enrichment program in the cruise ship industry. But this was not to be a bit of one-off good luck for me. As an oceanographer, I could sail on any itinerary since I talked about the oceans under the ship. So my lectures were not geographically dependent on where the ship was traveling. And also, the companies seemed to like what I was doing, and I kept getting invited back. And it seemed like some years I was getting more cruises than there were offered, I should say, than there were days in a year. Well, I set out to try as many different itineraries as my personal time permitted, because I still had day jobs. As a result, I've sailed on 50 cruise ships for 40 different companies in my 48 years of cruising. And by 2022, I had made over 160 cruises all over the world, including three to the North Pole and several to the Antarctic. Therefore, it's no surprise in my 48 years of cruising experience, I've given me some very interesting experiences. I've tried to write some of them down. For years, I've been doodling away at a book-length manuscript with the working title, 50 Years Before the Buffet. Of course, I offer apologies to Richard Henry Dana and his classic work, Two Years Before the Mast. Well, I'll begin with the term captain's choice or catch of the day. Sometimes that did not refer to a menu item or some other special gift to the passengers. It was when the captain selected a person of interest among the single ladies when they arrived on board. Not saying that all the captains did this, but I've seen it happen. How could you resist? Here's an authority figure, and he's in a beautiful uniform, and some ladies could not resist. And then there were the gentleman hosts who provided dance partners for the women who were traveling alone, but nothing more. These are men who are often widowers, so who 
had spent years ballroom dancing, social dancing. All they just love dancing, and so this is an opportunity to do a lot more dancing. And the companies uh, solicited this kind of person to come aboard the ships and act as dance hosts. Some of their stories, however, were epic. The poor guys were often at risk, caught between amorous ladies and the company's strict rules of conduct. And occasionally, a newer gentleman host who didn't know any better would be invited up to the cabin of one of the ladies on some pretense. And I know of at least two cases where when the lady opened the door, she was in her birthday suit. So uh, it was it was an interesting life for these guys. And I always had a bit of sympathy for them because they were often between a rock and a hard place. But as for me, I made most of my cruises with my wife. It was my way of showing her the world. As a, of course, as a naval officer, I saw a lot of the world, but she was never with me. So this was a great thing for us to do. Though there were times when I traveled solo. That's when the dining room maitre d' took great particular perverse pleasure in putting me at the so-called Lonely Hearts table. Now, at the beginning of, of a cruise, all the passengers were assigned to a specific table, and that's where you remain for the entire trip with few exceptions. At my table, there were the widows, divorcees, and dysfunctional couples. And I'll tell you, I cannot count how many times I had the ship's laundry or dry cleaning service remove sweaty handprints from my trouser legs due to under-table hands on knees. So I didn't have a choice other than to not eat dinner. And that's a choice I favored many times. Today, most cruise ship companies do not have specified seat assignments at dinner time. And the restaurant is open for a set number of hours, and the guests are free to come and go as they please. Well, I certainly do not miss the old days when dining was not always pleasant. Remarkably, when I look in my closet, I still have some trousers that I wore on board the ships. And if I look carefully, I think I can still see faint outlines of sweaty palms. Well, that's all for now, and thanks for listening. I had a little bit of a mini rant prepared. And it's just, it's me venting, unfortunately. I totally get the attitude of, of the people who are doing this because they must get just inundated with people like, oh, I've got a YouTube channel and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. But when I'm trying to sort of publicize the podcast or even just engaging with a few educational communities like on Facebook or, or Instagram or things like that, Twitter, I think we've got some really interesting firsthand stuff. So say in the last couple of weeks, it was your latest deepest squid paper uh -huh. and so there was a few communities talking about that so i said like oh that's great we are the people behind that and here is an interview with squid expert mike vicchioni and here is some like super super relevant content for what you guys are talking about like first-hand stuff and it gets deleted as like self-promotion and I, oh, really? I do get it yeah but then like somebody puts the like super clickbaity monsters aliens weirdness at the same story but like butchered by a clickbaity churn out clicks website and that's allowed to stay on oh. the page but i'm like we're the people you're talking about like i was offering to to come and talk to you about it sorry i'm, I'm no expert on social media i couldn't give less of a monkeys about that but so who's deleting you the, the people or the platform they'll often be an admin so there'll be multiple people who oh, just okay, sort of right. curate the content and make yeah. sure it doesn't get off topic and things like that and i do get that like it is self-promotion i don't know there, there was some some other don stuff as well like there was a a submarine community that were talking about Don's Trieste dive. I said like, oh, we interviewed him about this. Here's, here's the link. And we've gotten to know Don really well. He's a regular contributor. If you're a fan of Don Walsh, then here's loads more stuff. And again, that got removed as self-promotion. You're all guessing what he thought and how he felt down there. I've got an interview of him telling you, <laughs> but you don't want to hear it. Oh, that's weird. Social media. And I totally get that they must just get loads of people trying to sell Ray-Bans on their site and things like that. But uh, it just got a little bit frustrating when like, the next comment is then a really bad article that does a really bad job of what I was trying to give them sort of firsthand. That's it. That's my rant. I'm going to stop now. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. I think I'm, I'm going to jump into social media soon anyway. I've, I've got myself a Twitter account. <laughs> but I only got a Twitter account to take on the conspiracy theorist who's accusing me of finding the Malaysian airliner. And uh, he just immediately blocked me anyway. Cause he, did, oh. he, did, he didn't want me to tell people that it was absolute nonsense. <laughs> so I have a Twitter account now. I have no followers. Uh, a couple <laughs> of people have asked me to, to be their friends or whatever the hell it works. I don't know. And I haven't replied. You used Twitter correctly in that you used it to argue with someone. 
immediately blocked so there doesn't matter though because I, I managed to get his email address and we've had quite a hefty conversation since then so uh, yeah oh have you made friends afterwards maybe it's time i got on social media so i can start like blocking people and being horrible to people and then generally spreading a bit of hate amongst the science community <laughs> just join in oh i do start to to despair and I'm, I'm realizing it more and more because like we project some of our like i wouldn't even say fringe but we sort of project our opinions that you'd probably never say in like polite dinner party company of course you wouldn't any person you know within your circle of friends is going to have at least one opinion or belief that really gets under your skin and is the antithesis of everything you believe in but we cope with each other in the day to day because you see that person as a rich tapestry and that's just one element like the reason this started coming to, to mind there's someone i've become friends with that i think we wouldn't be friends on social media because there's some elements that we totally feel opposite of but they're one of the absolute nicest people i know and they're, they're a really good friend and weirdly even the things we disagree about or we haven't even brought them up, but even the things I think we might disagree about, getting to know them better, I'm just like, oh, well, if you feel that way, you're actually coming about it from the best possible angle. We just, we don't have that level of forgiveness when it's all batted around online. I suppose this is sport of just yelling at people as yeah, well. Yeah, we were spoken this before about just a number of other scientists who've said something and they're totally misinformed or just wrong or just horrid about stuff that I've been doing. And of course, I'm not going to challenge them online. I'm not going to challenge them on social media. And I saw right to them and say, come on, let's have a conversation. And every single time they're like, no, we're not having a conversation. We're not having a chat. We're not going to make friends. It's just that I've scored some points and that's the game they play. So I just don't engage. I don't think that's how we're built to interact. It's not. Might be why we're all feeling a bit sad. <laughs> it's not they'll get they'll get the comeuppance in the end first thing you do now whenever someone applies for a job or something like that first thing you do is you go start stalking them on social media and go no <laughs> you're not getting the job uh and so it backfires in the end well it's interesting when the the crux of the annoyance is why wasn't i involved in this actually you were getting round to them and there were plans yes. to have them involved yeah but you've just offended every single person who was about to give you a very lucrative job but anyway <laughs> yeah it's not all bad though I've had some of my absolute favourite interactions thanks to the podcast. As we're wrapping up this episode, we've got a little bit of announcement. <laughs> Listeners have been requesting this for a long time. It's taken me so long to get it organised. But we now have official Deep Sea Podcast merchandise, which I'm finding very, very strange to see this like in the real world. I'm actually wearing a Deep Sea Podcast t-shirt right now, uh, I realise, just because... I don't have many clothes. Can you get Deep Sea Podcast aprons and soft furnishings? You can. I went through Redbubble, which allows you to print on loads and loads of stuff. And I, I like them because they have loads of different like styles of t-shirts. They have like proper fitted t-shirts and lots of different fabric types and the, the prints come out quite well. But they do have like this massive catalogue. And I don't think I enabled it, but there was the option for having the logo on a throw pillow. Because it's a square logo, it actually worked quite well. I'm, I'm tempted yeah. maybe just to get one for myself, but uh, there are tote bags. I've always said that when I bake cakes, I like to bake cakes wearing a Deep Sea Podcast apron. <laughs> just, just saying. But the t-shirts the come out really nice. The stickers, I really like. I stuck one on my water bottle. They came out quite nicely. So there's one hey, which... Are you, are you paying for this, by the way? If you're getting freebies, why am I not getting freebies? Well, you've got to have samples to make sure it's working right. Give me your address. I will send you merch. So yeah, we've got uh, we've got the logo, which works quite nicely because I've made it so it would be clear on a podcast feed so that prints nice and clean. And then the first bit of references from the show is from episode eight, though last year's Valentine's one, the one with James Cameron on it, where you said turning the lights on in the vampire department, which I thought was just a brilliant turn of phrase. You just want to see what all the vampire squid are doing, right? You just want to turn the lights on in the vampire department. They think they've got the place to themselves. They think they've got some privacy. There I am. Deep sea pervert, Tom Lindley. There's you with a heart-shaped box of chocolates staring blindly into a vampire squid's eyes. Oh, well, that's not making the episode. No, I think that has to stay in. You are a deep sea pervert, though. Unfortunately, that keeps coming up. That's not the first time <laughs> that has come up. Uh, so maybe yeah. I am. Maybe yeah. I need to accept that. So there will be links in the show notes. I put it out on our social media. A few people have already started purchasing stuff, which is, well, lovely. Oh my God, really? Yeah, yeah. We, we do have <laughs> fans out there, it seems. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand. Yeah, people are listening to this. I know. I know it doesn't make sense. Who? Explain yourselves. I'm not putting ourselves down here or nothing, but who is listening? That's amazing. <laughs> So does that mean there's going to be loads of people out there baking cakes and deep sea podcast aprons? Look, you, you're really backing me into a corner with this apron thing. I, I hadn't, I hadn't planned an apron. <laughs> I'm sure I saw one when you were flicking through it. Well, I was showing you like all the available options, but some of them were insane, like yoga pants. Well, deep sea podcast yoga pants that would work. Do it. 
make it happen. Fine. Okay, more to come. Anyone who's bought any of the merch, like, please send us pictures. Honestly, we find this whole thing really, really strange. We started this project, we really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed the way it seems to be taking off. And it would feel even stranger to see that there are people out in the real world wearing it on a t-shirt. And that concludes this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. Feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is in the show notes, along with all of our social media as well. If you'd like certain types of merch in the future, let me know and I'll see what we can do. So until the next time, we'll deep see you next time, and we abyss you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company Armatus Oceanic. If you would like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can help you with technology, planning, logistics, everything you need to set up an expedition. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can help with fact checking, storytelling, presentations, podcasts, this kind of thing. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone. I, I also have to apologize because I'm pretty late for my next meeting. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you need to go? Yeah, apologies. Um, only because it's actually our Fathomnet meeting. <laughs> oh, gee. Ah, I'm the worst. Sorry. I didn't know you had no a worries. tight deadline. No worries.